Good morning. I am Mark Hazi, a board member of the Minnesota Justice Research Center. And uh, I am honored to introduce and facilitate this next session where we will uh, continue to remember and honor the life and legacy of Tom Johnson. As many of you know, Tom lost a long battle to cancer earlier this year. I miss him dearly. I know many of you, you do as well. Tom was many things. He was my friend and mentor, as I know he was to many. He was the founder and heart of this organization, as you've already heard. He also instigated and led many other justice initiatives over the years. He was an accomplished attorney and elected public servant. And always, he was a loving husband and father. And if that wasn't enough, he was an amazing long distance runner. Tom's life was the epitome of a life well lived. He was also a man of faith and conviction, of endless positive energy and ideas, a great sense of humor, and both confident and humble. I'm sure I'm missing a whole bunch of things Tom did and was. We could spend all day remembering and honoring all of them. But I know Tom would want us to quickly pivot to something else. And that is continuing the fight for justice he gave so much of his time and energy to. So I hope this session will help us to do that. Whether you had the privilege of knowing Tom or not, to hold up his example for lessons about how to move this work for justice forward together. First, we're going to hear from Senator Amy Klobuchar, then we'll have a discussion with others that knew Tom well. Before we begin, I want to note that Lathrop GPM, uh, GPM is for Great Plant Moody, is generously supporting this conference and this session in particular. Lathrop GPM is where Tom was a shareholder and based his professional life as an attorney. And I know the firm was incredibly supportive in many different ways of Tom's community service work. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our Senator, Amy Klobuchar. Uh, I've got to pull up the video here. Let me share my screen first. Fortunately, we're a little ahead of schedule here. I did this last night. Here we go. Check sound. Are you all seeing that? Can somebody tell me? We're good. Okay, thank you. Hello, and thanks to the Minnesota Justice Research Center for asking me to join you today and to say a few words about my friend, my mentor, and my neighbor, Tom Johnson. It's been a difficult time in our country for quite a while, but particularly tumultuous last few weeks, although I like the way it ended. The American people have chosen Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to run this country. And in Joe's words, it's time to stop the grim era of demonization it's time to give each other a chance and that this is not a partisan moment, it's an American moment. It's a moment when the work you are all doing today and that you've been doing for quite a while, reimagining a justice system that functions more effectively and more humanely has never been more important. Since coming to the Senate 13 years ago, I've watched as change has come inch by inch, but we must move by miles. There is systematic racism at every level of our justice system, and it has taken far too long to right these wrongs. And it's on all of us to get something done and deliver a more fair and just system. This is not just a time for half measures or equivocation. It's a time for real change, swift action. 
including accountability for misconduct from law enforcement, changing police practices, and making our justice system more transparent. No one understands what's at stake here better than all of you. And certainly no one understood it better than my friend Tom Johnson, which is why in this difficult moment, I'm especially grateful to remember a man so dedicated to justice, to fairness, and to decency. You know, Tom's last conversation with me was that he wanted to be here until the election, that he wanted to be able to vote. Uh, and I know right now he's smiling down at us. I could use a lot of phrases to describe Tom. Distinguished attorney, public servant, trusted mentor, advocate for justice. But for me, he was my neighbor first and foremost. John Abigail and I moved in across the street from the Johnsons when Abigail was only a year old. And I think my husband would rue that day for a while because every single day I'd look over and say things like, Tom's mowing the lawn. Or Tom and Victoria have already planted their flowers early. They don't think it's going to be a frost. Or, oh, look, they have up their Christmas lights way at the top. They were the perfect neighbors. And by the way, when I got to the Senate, after having lived across them for a, quite a while as county attorney, I'd often get home on a Friday at 7 p.m., 7 p.m., 8 p.m. John and Abigail were back in D.C. I'd be starving. I would just go over and knock on their door. Have you guys eaten yet? And of course, they always had, but... They'd always make me dinner. Tom served, as you all know, as a Hennepin County attorney for 12 years. And after I took over the job years later, I would often turn to him for advice. And he was always willing to help and to offer his wisdom, humor, kindness, so many of his defining traits. I would go over to his house. I remember this right at the beginning to discuss policy or personnel or how I should handle a case. And I would say, um, things like at the beginning, ah, uh, this one guy, he, I know he's a good lawyer, but Tom, I mean, he himself has said that he is, quote, fearless in the face of supervision. And Tom would laugh and he'd say, uh, you know what? I hired that guy and he really started saying that from the day after I hired him. But what was cool about Tom is that after he'd say that, he'd say, let me tell you the really great things about this guy. Let me tell you about what he's done since he came to the office. Tom was an innovator. He worked on the civil commitment process and was an early advocate for making changes. He worked to enact and enforce county environmental ordinances, including the criminal prosecution of companies that were improperly disposing of hazardous waste. He drafted and helped pass a number of new state laws on issues as varied as parental kidnapping, deaths caused by drunk drivers, neglect or endangerment of children, and commercial bribery. It's only fitting that Tom was working up until his final days after the horrific murder of George Floyd. He was working again on how to improve the lives of others by proposing ideas on criminal justice reform. In fact, just one week before he died, I know he attended one of your virtual board meetings because he was so committed to your mission of pursuing fair treatment for those in the criminal justice system. And I know it's a legacy you will carry on without him but in his honor. Put simply, Tom was a groundbreaking leader on criminal justice reform for decades, a fierce advocate for ending racial disparities. Last Christmas, Tom wrote his own obituary, of course, he was always a detailed guy, in which he said that nothing had given him more satisfaction than calling attention to the unacceptable racial disparities in the justice system. His voice and wisdom on these issues will be deeply missed in this moment as Minnesota and the nation continues to seek justice for George Floyd and as we work to end systemic racism in our country with systemic change. Tom always did good. Domestic abuse, race and justice, his principled stand against the death penalty, and his passion came from his decades of public service. He was elected to the Minneapolis City Council at just 28 years old and wrote that he used to wander around City Hall thinking, if the public only knew how little I know. But despite or perhaps because of his humility, Tom got things done. Fighting for truth in housing inspections, campaign finance disclosure, prohibit, prohibit the prohibition of discrimination based on sexual orientation. He later went on to found Corner House. Tom was a tireless advocate and champion for all Minnesotans. He left his mark around the world. He co-authored the Minnesota Protocol, a manual for preventing and investigating extra legal 
arbitrary and summary executions that was actually adopted by the UN back in 1992. He didn't just see things in the context of the immediate, but he would look far into the future. He didn't just see things on a headline or even worse, a tweet. He'd be looking out onto the horizon. That would explain why he did so much. But I think you know nothing gave him more joy than his beloved family, including his wife, Victoria, and his children, Hunter, Jill, Kayla, and Ben. He was so proud of all they had achieved, and rightfully so. During Tom's funeral, his dear friend of 50 years, David Lebedoff, noted that, quote, every day of his crowded life, Tom gave comfort and counsel to those who needed it. He likened Tom's impact to a stone skipping across the water, spreading ripples outward from each new place it touches the water. Among his many accomplishments and accolades, that is truly Tom's legacy. Spread ripples of kindness across the many, many lives he touched. We would all be wise to honor Tom's legacy by spreading kindness of our own. Thank you so much for giving me this moment to remember Tom and for all of us to be able to sit back with all the important work you're doing and I want us to do in Washington next year. Let's take that moment and remember, what would Tom do now? He'd have that smile and he'd just say, okay, we won. Get to work. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. What a great, uh, personal, thoughtful um, tribute to Tom. What we're gonna do now is take a few minutes, uh, like I mentioned, to uh, discuss Tom and his legacy and what we can learn from it with uh, some other folks that were very close to him. Uh, one is Father Daniel Griffith, who is a professor at the University of St. Thomas School of Law, my alma mater, uh, and he's also uh, attends to the the flock at um, Our Lady of Lourdes Catholic Church in Northeast Minneapolis where Tom and Victoria attended. Um, and we're also joined by uh, Barbara Fry, who is the uh, director of the human rights program at the University of Minnesota um, College of Liberal Arts. And I think at the Humphrey Center as well. And uh, uh, Barbara was also a close friend of Tom's and, and has done a lot of work with him over the years. So what uh, my first question for, um, for you all, and I think I'll ask um, you to go first, Father Griffith, um, so that you know those people who don't didn't know Tom can get a little more sense of what kind of person he was. Um, what's one of your fondest memories of Tom? So thank you, Mark, and thanks to the Minnesota Justice Research Center for inviting me on this panel. And we are indeed uh, proud of Mark. Uh, at St. Thomas Law uh, for his uh, commitment to justice. Uh, a couple of memories uh, came to mind, um, two involving trips. Uh, one trip out to Napa Valley to visit Tom and Victoria in February. They would often uh, spend February there at, at a, a friend's home. And it was just a wonderful experience. Anybody who knows Tom knows how bright and what a curious mind he had, how many things he knew about different areas. Uh, he was really a Renaissance man. And um, we had a terrific time. And the highlight was a long walk with Tom uh, around a lake. Um, and we just talked about everything under the sun. And I was always learning. And Tom was always, he was always imparting wisdom, but he never did it in a way that it just came from him. You know, it was never, I have something to teach you. He just was so conversant. Another trip uh, was to Israel with a group uh, from the parish and other, uh, it was a pilgrimage, you know, to the Israel and the Holy Land. And again, Tom's curiosity, uh, he was like a wide-eyed kid. And um, I remember one evening sharing a pizza and some wine with a group and we were talking about politics and I had to keep telling myself, all right, stop talking, listen to Tom, you can learn something. And just his, his wisdom uh, on, on the topic of politics and obviously justice as well. And then dinners, I would say, Mark, uh, dinners with friends, with parishioners. Uh, Tom always had such an interest in people. Uh, he, again, his curiosity, and he would celebrate their accomplishments, and he would get excited and 
I said this at his, at his funeral homily, you could audibly hear him delight in other people's accomplishments and good things. Uh, we miss him dearly, but uh, boy, those memories remain and they're, they're certainly warm memories. You're muted, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. How about you, Barbara? What was one of your fondest memories of Tom? Thanks, Mark. And it's a real honor to be on this panel with uh, with you and and Father Griffith and uh, Amy by by video. Um, it's uh, quite a collection and uh, to give service to. Uh, to Tom and his legacy. Thanks to the Minnesota Justice Research Center and for inviting me to participate. So um, my experience with Tom is on the international side, something that many of you who've worked with Tom on domestic issues um, might not be aware of is his deep involvement in um, international human rights issues. And uh, Tom was one of the founders of what's now called the Advocates for Human Rights. Uh, back in 1983, uh, there were about a dozen of us in the legal community who established this organization, originally known as uh, the Minnesota Lawyers Committee. And um, Tom was one of those founders. And it was really my privilege as a young attorney working alongside these amazing public figures like Tom Johnson and Don Fraser, who um, Tom was county attorney and, and Don was mayor. And um, thinking about how they not only exhibited integrity and professionalism, but they actually showed how they cared deeply about the rule of law and human rights outside their own jurisdictions or their own political bubble. I don't think that they gained any particular political um, bump from being involved in issues in Central America or you know, working on international standards. So some of my earliest memories are sitting in the boardroom of the Hennepin County Attorney's Office for these 7.30 a.m. meetings, which we would have with committees of the board of directors because it wouldn't conflict with anyone's court schedules and um, talking about human rights investigations that we might wanna uh, carry on in different parts of the world and thinking that this was normal, right? This was my introduction as a young lawyer into the legal community. And it was really only later that I realized this was not normal at all. And really it was, um, uh, it was uh, the involvement of people like Tom and, and Don Fraser who gave Minnesota this visibility internationally. Um, just a couple brief accomplishments of Tom. He was involved in really all aspects of the organization. A um, couple that stand out really connect nicely with his work in criminal justice. So uh, one is, as the Senator mentioned, he was one of the drafters of the Minnesota Protocol on Death Investigations. And um, he contributed not only to drafting the legal investigation standards for that document, which also included autopsy, autopsies and uh, excavation of skeletal remains is, is the, the gold standard in the international community for death investigations. But he represented us in diplomatic efforts um, at the UN Congress on Crime Prevention and Control in the late 80s to, to uh, encourage um, uh, publication of those standards. Uh, Tom also prompted the Minnesota Lawyers Committee to get involved in the death penalty work. And in 1991, he brought in Steve Bright, who was then executive director of the Southern Prison Prisoners Defense Committee in Atlanta to get us launched on a pro bono initiative that has lasted to this day at the Advocates where Minnesota, even though we don't have the death penalty, fortunately, and state, for state crimes in Minnesota, that we have pro bono lawyers who work on behalf of death row inmates um, in other parts of the country. Um, one um, interesting hi highlight that I found just kind of paging through old materials was in, in uh, 1990 or 91, I guess, um, Tom uh, had a debate with Tony Boza, who was the former police chief of 
of Minneapolis and was called death penalty pro and con Boza versus Johnson. <laughs> and it was in the 24th floor conference center of the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. And um, I can just only imagine how entertaining that was. Yeah. Well, thanks, Barbara. My uh, fondest memory of Tom was just really quickly when I first met him, I was a law student um, and I did an externship at the Council on Crime and Justice where he was the president. They were doing, you know, at that time and, you know, towards the end of their, the, the long, the, the large number of studies on racial disparities in the criminal justice system. And my project was, I was, my assignment was to um, help look at uh, disparities in, in charging decisions by prosecutors. And so I was to go up to the county attorney's office in Anoka and interview people and try to figure out what was, you know, some of these things that were going on there and write a report. And I had no idea what I was doing. I, you know, th these issues were all new to me. And Tom just, I remember sitting in his office and he just spoke to me like, I absolutely knew what I was doing. He had complete confidence in me, even though he, you know, he barely knew me. And um, I think that just, you know, speaks to his, uh, Tom would meet people where they, where they were at. And regardless of his years of experience and having been county attorney and city council member and accomplished attorney, he, you couldn't tell. He just, he, you know, he had great confidence, but he walked humbly and he met people where they were at. And I think that's something we can all um, learn from, you know, the importance of, you know, being in proximity to people and meeting people where they're at um, and treating them in a way that, you know, that, that they're, they're equal to all of us as they are. Um, so the, uh, what I would, the, the second question I want to ask you guys is, um, as I mentioned, you know, what can we learn from Tom's life and legacy that we can apply? I mean, I think everybody is here because, you know, we all actually, you know, want to do something about these issues. And in doing that, what, what can Tom's life and how he moved in the world teach us about that? Um, I'll, I'll let you start, Barbara. Um, and just so you, you guys know, we've got According to the where we were supposed to be, we've got 10 minutes left in our panel. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I was thinking about this. I, I guess I have four points to make. Um, so first of all, that it, it pays to look beyond our own borders and our own bubble. Um, this is something I've learned my whole life is that I have uh, learned the most message, the most uh, uh, from, uh, about how to deal with adversity from my colleagues um, in other countries who are so creative and imaginative and brave in doing so. So, you know, you think about um, doing that in the way that Tom did as a, a means of solidarity for people who are suffering in different parts of the world, um, mutual learning, uh, getting ideas from people who confronted things that you didn't think you'd confront in your country, but now we are. And also inspiration that it's, um, you know, I think about uh, Tom was participated in a, a study tour to Central America, one of our very first uh, group experiences. And I think that that, um, the, the kind of lessons that group learned really inspired the organization for years to come. Um, the second lesson is, is competence and excellence are needed in social justice work. This is not just for people who, uh, you know, uh, are doing this because they're committed, but they don't want to work hard. That Tom was was excellent in everything he did, and that's um, uh, something that we need if we're going to actually um, reach our goals. Um, the third is is obviously decency and respect for other people of all walks of life. Um, acting, Tom was a great listener and Father Griffith, you really nailed it on this thing about like, you always look forward to meeting with Tom because he would celebrate with you in your accomplishments. And that's, it's something you realize not very many people do. They get mm -hmm. in their own heads and what a great gift that is to lift other people up by respecting them and, and celebrating with them. And then finally, a sense of humor right? It's, these are, it, this work is hard. And um, 
uh, Tom was always positive, always smiling. And I think about, um, I've been fortunate to work with Tom's son, Hunter Johnson, who very closely, who Hunter has a master's of human rights from the University of Minnesota. And, and uh, one of the great gifts that Hunter gave uh, Tom it was he got a sports car for Tom's last birthday and drove him around. This was during COVID, so he couldn't go and see people in person and had a, a takeoff on Ferris Bueller's day off and had Tom Johnson's day off and they drove around in this sports car so that he could meet with all his friends. And that, that's exactly the kind of you know, life-giving touch that uh, represents Tom's positive attitude so well. Thanks, Barbara. How about you, Father Griffith? Well, thanks to Barbara. Those great uh, characteristics and, and so true. Um, one of the things that, that I'm constantly learning is how many things Tom was involved in in terms of founding. I didn't know until he passed away that he was involved in founding the Advocates for Human Rights. My niece is an immigration lawyer, also a St. Thomas law grad, and just finished a stint uh, at, at the Advocates. And, and so Tom has all these things that are just part of his uh, legacy. I, I'll point to five uh, quickly, and I think they, they complement uh, Barbara's list as well, uh, that Tom understood authority and power always in terms of service. Authority and power that one is vested with is never for oneself or for climbing a ladder or self-aggrandizement, but it's always for service of others. Uh, and, and Tom lived that out. Uh, when he concluded, uh, he was given a, an award by Hennepin County and he humbly noted where he could have done things better. It was classic uh, Tom because it's always oriented to service. Secondly, the importance of, of personal virtue uh, and having personal virtue integrated into one's life. For Tom, those virtues came so naturally, so he didn't think about it, but the virtues stood out, um, and the ones that come to mind is justice. Uh, I think um, one of the judges in Hennepin County noted Tom in the same way I did. We had never met anybody who had a more preternatural sense for justice. Uh, you know, just totally uncommon in terms of its depth. Uh, of course, the folks on this, uh, on this, uh, in this conference are all committed to justice, but Tom's justice was extraordinary. Uh, humility, as, as Mark had noted. Um, and then just a generosity of spirit that was really off the charts, uh, always willing to get involved in so many ways. Um, you know, with all of the work he was doing everywhere else, he was always uh, rolling up his sleeves at Our Lady of Lourdes on our Justice and Charity Committee. We had a panel the other day for parishioners of color talking about their experience uh, in Minnesota. And I was thinking, well, who could I get to moderate the panel now that Tom's not here? Uh, and so that generosity of spirit, he was a humanist. Uh, not only was he a man of faith uh, and that right relationship with God, but he was a, he was a true humanist. Uh, in, a, in an extraordinary way, and human dignity was so important. Uh, so that would be second, personal virtues. Third, inclusivity. Tom wanted everybody at the table. Uh, Barbara touched on this as well. Um, he wanted everybody's voice represented. Uh, he was not selective in how he approached things, uh, but rather inclusive. Uh, that was very, very important. And he wasn't, he's not, Tom was not an ideologue. Uh, he was a proud Democrat, no doubt, but he was he didn't have an ideological construct uh, that that he filtered things through. Rather, he he approached people as they are, as Mark noted, and he approached issues as they are. And uh, so that was part of his inclusive uh, nature. Number four, I would say experience centered dialogue. Uh, whenever we were taking up an issue at Our Lady of Lourdes, whether it was homelessness, or um, re-entry for folks who had been in jail or prison. Tom always said, you need to have this centered around somebody who has experienced those issues. Uh, rather than approaching it as an abstraction, these are real lives that, that, that people's, people have been living and, and affected by, and we need to learn from their experience. 
uh, I think that's critical in issues of justice is that it's led by the conversation by those who have experienced injustices uh, in terms of light of, of wisdom and truth. Uh, that was something that Tom uh, really uh, was, uh, was a champion of. And then finally, I would say, you know, of course, anybody who is part of this conference, anybody who's sentient, right? Uh, uh, somebody who has eyes are open in Minnesota are rightly disturbed by the disparities when it comes to, uh, to racial uh, justice across all of the, of the categories in Minnesota. Uh, it's shocking, it's disturbing, but Tom, with his curious mind, would ask the question, why? What in the culture, what in the seeds and the soil? So Amy talked to Senator Klobuchar, talked about the horizon. He would, always, he would also wanna get down to the, to the earth what is the what is the cultural uh, contribution to racial disparities? And then what he would try to do is bring people together to have a conversation, a robust conversation that's inclusive, that's respectful, that's enlightened, that's led by experience and and centered around experiences of injustice to try to to try to really respond to the injustices that we see in Minnesota. So I think we can learn from Tom all of those characteristics in terms of how we would approach uh, these challenging issues in Minnesota. Mark, we can't hear you. You want us to close it off for you, Mark? <laughs> yeah, Mark, we can't hear you. <laughs> Try now. Barbara, do you want to do the last? Uh, Why don't we just say thank you for, for this opportunity. I did want to mention one thing, but in signing off, and, and we all know what a family man Tom was, and uh, um, that uh, extended, you know, we have to acknowledge the role of Victoria in, in, uh, in Tom's successes in in his life. And also, I want to acknowledge that Victoria herself um, was involved in the Minnesota Lawyers Committee from the very beginning. And, um, uh, and that was something they enjoyed doing together. And uh, it, it has blossomed uh, into the next generation. So we're, we're really lucky to have this Johnson family as part of our heart and soul of this community. So um, thanks again from all of us. And uh, we wish you the best of luck uh, with the conference moving ahead. Yeah, amen. Great. Well said, Barbara. Thanks, Mark, and everybody for the great, great work you're doing.